Hello, my most beautiful of people. Today, we are going to enter a new age, a new approach to arriving at truth. Science and philosophy will be revolutionized in the 1600s and 1700s, and we are going to examine through some key individuals how that took place. We're going to skim the surface on all of these individuals. Please know that. But hopefully, we will gain a better understanding uh, of how key contributions made by very influential individuals created tremendous shifts in our thinking and our understanding of the natural universe and brought in literally a new age. Let us begin. Most of the individuals that we are going to look at today um, will hail from France, um, England, some also from the Netherlands and the German states. Again, we saw in our last lesson how centers of knowledge and debate have moved from the Mediterranean to the uh, northwest of Europe, in part because of the censorship and counter-reformation of the Catholic Church. They are censoring individuals, and so centers of thought move northward up until the 15 and 1600s, men attempted to arrive at truth through church dogma, religious authority, and Aristotle. This is medieval thought. This is how you arrive at truth, through church authority, faith in that authority, religious dogma, uh, decisions made by the Roman Catholic Church. If you want to arrive at your answer, look for it in the writings of the Bible or the decisions of the church authority. Very top-down, very top-down, and very uh, pluralistic. Uh, we are not looking at the individual. We are looking at the community. We are looking at the, 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 the body of man. Central to medieval thought also was Aristotle. Aristotle, uh, writing in the 300s BC, was a Greek philosopher who was incredibly influential. Uh, by the late medieval period, Christian thinkers such as Thomas Aquinas have been able to, even though he's pre-Christian, I could almost use the word marry Aristotle and and Christian uh, 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 beliefs. He dominates. He dominates universities throughout the medieval period. Now, let me go back just to Aristotle. Aristotle claimed a great many things, including that everything was made up of five elements, earth, fire, air, water, and ether. Modern thought is going to challenge medieval thought. Modern thinking is going to attempt to arrive at truth without religion, God or Aristotle, and attempt to answer questions in natural, not supernatural terms. We are moving in a direction of completely separating faith and reason. I don't want you to think for a minute that everyone that I'm going to be discussing in this lesson didn't have faith in anything supernatural. I'm not saying that by any means, but they sought to arrive at truth without faith, without supernatural elements, without uh, bringing religion into these discussions. In England, Holland, and France, we have a new era, a new era, new ideas, new beliefs. Key individuals are going to lay the foundations of modern thought and usher in a revolution in science, knowledge, and how humans view themselves and the natural universe. The result, revolutions in science and philosophy. These ideas are going to create storms. They are going to challenge the very basic understanding of our place in the universe and how to arrive at truth cataclysmic for the old order and ushering in a new age. Let us first go to Britain, specifically 
England. I'm going to go, I'm going to take you through this, some key individuals, and please know that I am merely scratching the surface and I'm giving you a very simple understanding of, of these individuals and, and their beliefs. Please know that, and I, 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 I very much encourage you after watching this lesson to go out and do your own research. Um, there is a great many there's a great many uh, resources for you to to tap into. If one of these individuals really piques your, your interest, please, I beg you, go out and, and learn as much as you can. Sir Francis Bacon. The Sir Francis Bacon was an English philosopher, statesman, scientist, essayist, author, uh, an amateur scientist at best. Um, he will be very well connected within the English government. He will serve as both the Attorney General and Lord Chancellor of England. Now he is writing at the same time as Galileo is in Italy. In 1589, Galileo is named professor of mathematics at the University of Pisa. And he argues this, and this is revolutionary, that the natural universe could be explained through mathematics. This is one of the two central bases of Western scientific thought, that the natural universe could be explained through mathematics. Let me quote Galileo. Quote, the universe cannot be read until we have learned the language and become familiar with the characters in which it is written. It is written in mathematical language, and the letters are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures, without which means it is humanly impossible to comprehend a single word. Bacon is going to develop. He's going to accept this and develop the other half of the basis of the scientific uh, 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 thought. Pardon me. Uh, Galileo, uh, as you will know, as I said in the last lesson, uh, gets into trouble. He gets into trouble because he challenges the commonly held belief that the sun revolves around the earth. Medieval thinkers believed that we were the center of the universe made in God's image and that the sun revolved around the earth. Um, Copernicus, the Polish astronomer, is the first to uh, openly challenge this model. He said, no, the earth revolves around the sun. Galileo defends Copernicus. Galileo is in trouble because not only does it say in the Bible that Joshua had God command the sun to stay still in the sky. Um, but Aristotle as well said, no, the earth is the center of the universe and the sun revolves around it. So, so entrenched in biblical thought and Aristotle was the church and many great thinkers of the age that Galileo is um, put on house arrest. He is forced to recant. He is forced to recant, but his ideas live on, including that we can write the language of the universe in mathematics. Bacon will further develop this. He will accept, he will accept uh, a Galileo's assertion. However, he will develop and champion a new method of attempting to arrive at natural truth. This is the other half of scientific thought. So Galileo does one half. The universe is written in mathematical language. Well, Bacon develops the other half, and that is the empirical method, also known as the scientific method, or the Baconian method. This method was put forward in Bacon's book, Novum Organum, or New Method, in 1620. And what he is trying to do is replace Aristotle's uh, method of arriving at truth, put forward many, many hundreds of years earlier. This marks a break away from Aristotle. We break away from Aristotle's deductive reasoning to inductive reasoning away from the medieval towards the modern deductive and this is what aristotle champions is what something isn't inductive is what something is this is the direction in which we're taken in short in short the empirical method is a theory of inductive reasoning that calls for acquiring evidence through observation and experimentation rather than reason and speculation. This becomes the scientific method. I'm gonna read it again because it's so very important. The empirical method is a theory of inductive reasoning, what something is, that calls for acquiring evidence through observation and experimentation rather than reason and speculation. 
This is not new. Galileo had used this method as well as others. However, Bacon formulizes the process. This absolutely revolutionizes the way that many humans attempt to arrive at truth, and it lays the framework for the scientific method of observation, of being able to recreate it, of being able to lay out steps in a formulaic manner. He is laying the very groundworks of modern science in the West. And he's going to usher in, or help, not the only one, help to usher in a new age based more on science and reason rather than uh, faith and tradition. The effects. Well, as the 1600s passed and the 1700s began, Galileo's reduction of all natural phenomena to mathematical formulas and Bacon's empiricism would become the very basis of Western scientific investigation. In short, it ushers in an age of science. However, in the late 1600s, one question continued to perplex scientists who accepted the ideas of Copernicus, who accepted the ideas of Galileo, and that was, how do the planets and other heavenly bodies move in such an orderly fashion? What prevents them from crashing into each other? On this model, how do they seem to work in seamless uh, harmony? Well, Kepler, a German astronomer, had laid out his theory, his theory of ellipses. They don't move in circles. In circles, they would crash against each other. They move in these patterns. However, how do they do it remains a question. How do they move in these patterns? Because the patterns work. But how do these planets not crash into each other and remain on these paths? Well, this man, Sir Isaac Newton, is going to show the world, show the world um, how the planets move and why they don't crash into each other. Sir uh, Isaac Newton was an English physicist, a mathematician, widely regarded as one of the most influential scientists of all time. And he's going to champion Bacon's methods. In 1687, in his book, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, he proved Copernican model and Kepler's orbits uh, through his theory of gravity. He will develop this theory of gravity over 15 years. His theories, well, his most influential theory uh, was his theory of gravity. Now, he will tell the story many times how he was uh, inspired to develop this theory by watching an apple fall. Some uh, stories even have the apple falling on his head. That is most li uh, most likely untrue. But he lays out he lays out his theory of gravity as follows: One, the planets and all other objects in the universe moved through mutual attraction. That's gravity. Number two, every object in the universe affected every other object through gravity. Three, the attraction of gravity explained why the planets moved in an orderly fashion, not crashing about. More importantly, more importantly, he proves all of this mathematically. And this is what you need to be able to do. You need to be able to have others look at your work, recreate your findings. That's the very basis of Western science. You can find a descendant of Newton's tree at Cambridge University in England. Apart from his theories of gravity, Sir Isaac Newton will invent calculus. Uh, he will also develop the science of optics. The man was heads and shoulders, uh, uh, the other individuals of his age in so, so many ways. Now, just to stay on topic, on God, on God, Newton believed in an ordered universe created by an intelligent being. Again, he still had faith, but he was working on reason separately. He still had faith, but he was looking at knowledge and reason separately. The effects of Newton's work. Well, the geocentric model was forever discredited. This idea that the Earth sat at the center of the universe with all of the other planets revolving around it is disregarded. Now, that's a chink in the armor, is it not? 
What else in the Bible can be questioned? We're not there yet. But what other things are laid out in the, uh, in those pages that we can attack with science? That'll happen later, 1800s. We're not there yet. Uh, and number two, the scientific method became increasingly adopted throughout Europe. We continue with this shift away from deductive thought towards inductive thought. Very modern. We are entering. We have entered. No more entering. We have entered the modern age and the scientific revolution will follow. It will follow. Now, Sir Isaac Newton was buried at Westminster Abbey. This shows you the prominence that he enjoyed and the the amount of celebration he enjoyed. Now, Westminster Abbey is a, a cathedral in London. It is reserved as a burial place for kings. Uh, Queens, and to have Sir Isaac Newton buried at Westminster Abbey showed you how his ideas were literally changing the world. He is buried like a king in Westminster Abbey, the National Cathedral of Great Britain. The effects of the scientific revolution, at least on the West, on the West, we're still in Western Europe. Well, in 1660, the Royal Society was established in London. This is a scientific society. They will accept men of various religions, various nations, because that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter uh, uh, who you are. It matters on what you think and how intelligent and how dedicated you are. In 1672, Sir Isaac Newton was elected as one of the earliest fellows of the Royal Society. He will... Uh, remain president until 1727. Other, other scientific societies will emerge in the German states, Holland and France. And again, to have an entire society, a royal society, no less, dedicated to the attainment of knowledge and truth is a revolution. It's secular. The church has nothing to do with it. Faith has nothing to do with it. Let me show you the motto of the Royal Society. Words are empty. Words are empty. It doesn't matter what you say. It's can you prove it? Can you prove it through science? Now with the printing press, now, with the printing press, these ideas, along with reliable mail service, can spread throughout not just England, not just Britain, but throughout Europe. And others can build upon the work. And that's what science is all about. Aided by the printing press and a reliable mail service, suddenly new ideas, new ideas can be disseminated. And increasingly, increasingly, please make a note of this theology and philosophy would be seen merely as opinion in many, many circles. By the 1800s, many in Europe would believe that science trumped all other views and that any supernatural explanation or theory was simply false. Tradition and faith will no longer trump all, not in these circles, these very esteemed circles. Ideas, can spread with the printing press books and pamphlets are cheap we can build upon the works of others recreate using the scientific method this is a revolution this is an absolute european revolution just as important as a physical military revolution increasingly a more educated merchant class and aristocracy will come to accept the ideas put forward by members of the scientific community. Not all by any means, but science esteem is raised and the esteem of the church, not by all, but by many begins to be lowered. Again, increasingly religion is viewed as opinion. Faith and reason are moving farther and farther apart. It doesn't mean you're not without faith, but you're not applying that to your scientific investigations. At the same time, at the same time, to give you a physical 
to give you some physical evidence of this revolution in, in, in approach, many farmers begin to use a scientific approach when it comes to agriculture. And so from the middle 1600s, right up until the early 1800s, there is an agricultural revolution in Great Britain. New technological advances are applied. New machinery is developed. We are trying to produce more uh, 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 feed, cattle, crops, etc. And it works. It works by using science and what we understand to be science. They begin producing much bigger cattle. So proud, by the way, were they of these animals, these uh, very wealthy farmers, by the way, aristocrats with farmland, that they would have their portraits done of them. This is the equivalent of buying a sports car. And look, at this man doesn't have his wife or his children or uh, a saint in this image. He has his beloved pig. The similarities are a little unnerving between these two, by the way. Look at the size of this sheep. Through a scientific approach, we breed the biggest and the best with the biggest and the best and the biggest and the best. Just look at all of the dog breeds that emerge during this time. In the 1600s and 1700s, there was an explosion in dog breeds. We we're using a scientific approach to breeding, whether it be a cow or a French bulldog. Seeds are experimented with as well. Now, this had happened during medieval times. Please don't think that I, this was invented then, but it reaches a new level, as well as crop rotation. Farmers had been experimenting with crop rotation since the medieval age, but now it's becoming much more formulaic and we're publishing and we're looking at what worked for others, what works for us. And it produces a tremendous jump in the population. Look at that jump beginning in the middle 1600s, well into the 1800s. Look at that jump in the population of just the United Kingdom alone. And that is in large part due to the agricultural revolution, as well as um, cleaner cities and, 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 and better medicine. Many argue that the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s, which we will get to at a later date, was simply the application of science, the application of the scientific method to production and industry. And this creates the Industrial Revolution, transforming our world forever. We'll get there. What about philosophy and the scientific revolution? What about philosophy and the scientific revolution? Well, philosophy will be transformed. Traditionally, philosophy's goal was to arrive and is to arrive at truth and explain why and how things are. Philosophy had been a central part of Greek and Roman thought. The Catholic Church had adopted Aristotle's reasoning when it came to arriving at truth. By the late medieval era, philosophy was taught at all of Europe's universities. However, up until the 1600s, up until the 1600s, philosophy did not challenge Christian theology. That will soon change. Certain philosophers will become increasingly influenced by the scientific revolution, and they will attempt to do for philosophy what Bacon and Galileo had done for science. The effects, they will help propel Western thinking into the modern age. Various thinkers will emerge uh, that will pull us, kicking and screaming in some instances, towards the modern age era. Again, medieval thought and medieval philosophy was all about the church and authority. And we are breaking from that. We are breaking from that. Which brings us to the father of modern philosophy, Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes. He was a French philosopher, mathematician, and writer, although he will spend most of his time in the Dutch Republic. Descartes would apply his mastery of mathematics to philosophy, developing his own method of arriving at truth. He was the first of the continental rationalists. This is one school of philosophy. I'm not going to go too deep into the continental rationalists. Just believe, just know 
that the continental rationalists believed in fixed truths. Truth is truth, period. They were opposed to emotion, feeling, and intuitions as guides. And most often, they were opposed to faith and religion. However, Descartes was a religious man, a devout Catholic, but he will soon get in trouble with the church. We are trying to arrive at truth. And Descartes wants to set up a methodology at arriving at truth through philosophy. Again, he wants a Baconian method for philosophy. What was his methodology? The Cartesian method, also known as Descartes' method. This is how he introduces his method at arriving at truth in 1619. Um, Remember, he's a mathematician, so he wants simple formulas that can be recreated over and over again. He claims that earlier philosophers arrived at truth in too much of a messy fashion. He wants to clean it up. He hoped that this new method would allow later philosophers to arrive at truth as well. And this is still taught in many schools of philosophy today. How do we arrive at truth? Well, number one, we must recognize that universal truths exist. Number two, one must divide questions up and break them down into manageable steps like geometry, break down big questions into a lot of little questions. And number three, uh, start with the easiest questions first, just like in mathematics. And finally, number four, make and keep your findings general, broad, and leave in all steps and prove it all logically. Again, this method is still used by many schools of philosophy today. He's a mathematician. He wants a scientific approach, a mathematical approach to philosophy. Revolutionary. Cogito ergo sum. His most famous of statements, this represents a revolution. What does it translate to? Well, I think, therefore I am. In short, who determines truth? The answer, the self, the self. I have a mosquito buzzing around me. I apologize. <laughs> the simple meaning is this. The simple meaning of I think, therefore I am is this. That thinking about one's own existence proves in and of itself that I am. The simple fact that I am thinking of truth and that I wrestle with what is truth and that I doubt myself proves that I am possible. I am capable of arriving at truth. Previously, it was the church. It was the church that decided truth. And this is a giant shift towards the self. The modern era is all about the self. And we still live with uh, that uh, in modern society. The shift away from the community, away from the authority of the hierarchy towards the self at arriving at truth. A revolution, an absolute revolution. I determine what is true. My simple existence and my wrestling with the truth proves that I am arriving at truth. A revolution. Conflict with the church. Descartes actually believed that his methodology could be used to support the church, not tear it down. However, the church opposed them. The church opposed this methodology. Why? The church feared that other philosophers could and would use his method to attempt to disprove the existence of God. And they will, by the way. Later on, they will. Also, Descartes was opposed to tradition on its own. And the Roman Catholic Church was every part tradition. In 1663, the Pope placed Descartes' work on the Index of Prohibited Books. It's banned. In 1671, the absolute monarchist Louis XIV prohibited all lectures in Cartesian philosophy. We'll get to Louis XIV in a future lesson, but Cartesian methodology is an affront to the authority of institutions. Kings and popes are nothing but heads of institutions. Even Spinoza, who was a Jewish philosopher of the rationalist school, uh, he was excommunicated 
from his Dutch Jewish community for his writings. Um, Descartes, not the only one getting into trouble with his community for his understanding of the universe and arriving at truth. Our next individual is John Locke. John Locke was a member of an opposing school of philosophy, the empiricists. Now, I'm not going to get into what the empiricists are. Just know that that is the other school of philosophy dominating discourse at this time. Locke wanted to do for philosophy what Newton had done for science. He was an English philosopher, physician, and like Descartes, is a bridge between the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment, which we'll get to in a short time. Locke reacted against Descartes' universal truths. He was opposed to Descartes' universal truths. And he develops his own theories, published in 1690, Essay Concerning Human Understanding. He will lay out his truths. One, man reaches truth through his senses. Two, experiences shape reality. Experiences shape reality reality truths and reality aren't necessarily fixed which brings us to the tabula rasa which literally translates to blank slate john locke argued that at birth man is a blank slate and has no innate thoughts furthermore morality was taught and not innate not fixed and so he is at odds with the rationalist. Very influential is John Locke. We are all products of our environment. Every human, man, woman, is a blank slate at birth, and our realities and our truths are environmental end products. Very modern. On religion. Well, Locke will reject this idea of original sin, that man and woman are inherently uh, with evil. However, he does not reject Christianity, and he believed that we could uphold it through empirical processes. processes. He argued that the major tenets, at least the major tenets of Christianity, were in fact reasonable. And he argued for religious toleration of dissenting Protestants. By this time, we have many different churches of the protestant faith however he does not argue for religious toleration of catholics or unitarians who reject the trinity so it's limited i mean we're talking about the 1600s uh, but for his time very considered very very progressive on politics on politics and this is very important for the united states well he is writing during the reign of charles the second who believed that kings should have more power than parliament. He's writing at a time of absolute monarchy on the continent. Locke argued that rulers were not absolute in their powers and were subject to natural law. That's a very scientific approach to rulers. According to Locke, people enter political contracts with their kings and parliaments to protect their natural rights of, quote, life, liberty, and property. He also argued that rulers that violated the trust of those they ruled over should be overthrown. Mm -hmm. I wonder where that will be brought up again. Again, just because Charles II of England believes that he has power anointed by God doesn't necessarily mean that. And if he breaks that contract, that social contract, if he stops acting on behalf of the people, then we can rightfully overthrow him. Locke's writings, as I'm sure many of you already know, were deeply, deeply influential on the rebellious colonists and founding fathers a century later. Which brings us to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, also known as the Age of Reason. Now, this is what believers in the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason wanted to promote. They named themselves. They say the age that we are in now is the Age of Enlightenment. Previous ages, like the medieval age, oh, that's that was with the Dark Ages. Now we are finally entering a real era. It's to separate themselves from a previous age when the church decided truth. No, no, the church will no longer do this, said advocates of the Enlightenment or the Age of Reason. Now, followers 
of the Enlightenment or Age of Reason will come from France, England, many of the German states, and they are deeply influenced by English empiricists and continental rationalists. In France, which we're going to look at, which is very, very influential in the 1700s, we are going to look at a group of men known as the philosophes, the philosophers. And these men's ideas are going to have very, very, very deep uh, 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 ramifications and influences. France, France, ruled by an absolute monarch. On paper, no religious toleration, the Catholic Church and the king rule supreme. Just remember that the legacy of these philosophes um, are still felt in some part today. The philosophes. Now, they weren't a homogenous group. They will argue with each other as well. Don't think that they speak as one by any means. Most were not academics, but these are men of letters. These are men trained at universities. However, as much as they disagreed, there are a few universals that these philosophes shared. Number one, they will call into question the current status quo. And number two, and this is a firm belief, truth can be arrived to through reason. Truth can be arrived to through reason. It's innate. It's in us. We only have to get to it using our uh, innate reasoning skills. On government, most wanted political reform. Regardless, most will want political reform. Most wanted monarchs of the age to adopt rational approaches to government. And all agreed that the absolute monarchy of France was not reasonable or rational. And we're going to look at absolute monarchy in our next lesson. However, that being said, that being said, all opposed Athenian style democracy. They believed that rule by the masses was in fact mob rule. We can't have that. We can't have that. Um, so keep that in mind. Popular democracy uh, was something to be feared. And the founding fathers of the United States agreed uh, with this position, a very popular position that the people in general are prone towards acting on emotion, greed, etc. Almost all agreed that popular democracy was something to be avoided. On religion, many Enlightenment thinkers were very critical of the church, much more so in France, where there was less religious toleration than in England. Um, Voltaire, who we'll get to in a second, uh, once declared, crush the infamous thing, meaning the church. Most Enlightenment thinkers rejected Christ and his miracles. However, most called for increased religious tolerance, especially in France, where there is very little religious tolerance. Uh, thinkers and advocates of the Enlightenment usually lamented when the church ruled absolutely in Europe. They speak very sourly of the Crusades, uh, the uh, witch trials, um, the wars of religion where millions of Europeans will die, as well as the Inquisition, which still rages in many parts of the Catholic world. Some were, in fact, atheists like Diderot, which we'll get to later, but most were deists. Most were deists. They're not atheists. They're deists. Put simply, put simply, God created the universe in the fairly recent past, set everything into motion, and then walked away. This is the divine watchmaker. A watchmaker can make such fine, beautiful, intricate parts. He winds it up, or she winds it up, walks away, it runs. It runs on its own. God, the creator, gave humans everything they need. Set the watch and walked away. There's no such thing as a personal God involving himself in our daily lives. There's no supernatural intervention. The Godhead, the creator, created the universe and walked away. But God also created moral and natural laws. And we can find these natural truths, natural laws through reason. He's given us 
reason. Deists saw nothing contrary between deism and science, and this is the way many reconciled their lack of faith in organized religion, but still kept their faith in something other than themselves. Most were opposed to organized religion, uh, although they saw kernels of truth in all organized faiths. The creator created the world, gave us everything we needed, and then walked away. There's no devil and angel sitting on your shoulder. If you're stuck in traffic, don't pray to God. He's not interested. He's doing other things. On humanity, on humanity, many philosophes wanted to create a society of man based on reason. Most believed man was born with innate rules and human nature was universal, that there were universal truths among humans, just like in nature, just like in science, that natural laws were universal. Humans were not depraved. Humans have the innate ability to arrive at truth, reason, and morality on our own. The effects are these, that this idea of natural law will gain currency. It will gain currency. Furthermore, national differences between humans will be played down by these philosophes. They were more interested in looking at what unites us as humans rather than what divides us as humans. Very modern, incredibly modern. Voltaire, perhaps the most famous of these philosophes, born in France. His pen name was Voltaire. He was one of the earliest and most celebrated philosophes. He was a writer, historian, philosopher, and free speech advocate. He was the toast of Paris Salon's society. Very biting, very witty, very political. Um, very, in many ways, he would have been at very, he would have been at home writing for South Park, uh, using a, 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 a comedy to poke fun at elites and the powers that be. In 1720, Voltaire offended French authorities and was briefly imprisoned for his views. On government, Voltaire favored enlightened despotism to offset the church and aristocracy. Enlightened despotism, we'll get there. Enlightened despotism. He had zero faith in the masses, like most educated men of his age. Uh, he will flee to England. He will flee to England, where he loved the religious toleration, the intellectual and political climate of the age. He was a huge fan of Newton, and he attended Newton's funeral, and he marveled at how a man of lowly birth, who was nothing more than a man who had mastered his own work, could be celebrated and buried like a king. That would have never happened in France. The equivalent a scientist buried at Westminster Abbey? Never, never, ever. In 1759, he published his most famous work, Candide. In it, he attacked war, religious persecution, unwarranted optimism about the human condition. He believes that society can improve, but he will remain a pessimist. It, in Candide, uh, he has one of my favorite lines and just shows you how many... In many ways, things haven't changed at all since the 1700s. He wrote, in every province, the chief occupations in order of importance are lovemaking, malicious gossip, and talking nonsense. Nothing's really changed. Nothing has really changed. What about Montesquieu? Also a Frenchman. He was a noted social commentator, political thinker, best known for his 1748 spirit of laws, which was a response to the absolutism of the French monarchy. In Spirit of Laws, he laid out three firm beliefs. One, laws should be rational. Two, monarchs should not have absolute rule, that their powers must be checked. And finally, number three, working on the English model, which he was a very big fan of, Power needs to be divided within governments. He was a giant proponent of the separation of powers. In England at this time, they have separation of powers. This will be very, very influential, again, on 
American founding fathers when we abandoned our old constitution for our current constitution in 1789. Our next philosophe was Condorcet. Condorcet, a aristocrat, French philosopher, mathematician, and political scientist. Unlike many of his contemporaries, he advocated a liberal economy, free and equal education, constitutionalism, and equal rights for men and women and people of all races. My God, my God, what a revolutionary. In 1795, he publishes his sketch on human progress. Well, he doesn't publish it. He's already dead, but it is published, and it laid out his ideas. Number one, he was against monarchy altogether, which is rare, incredibly rare, that man was inherently good. What? What? That history is on a trajectory forward. We are getting better. We are moving forward. One day war will be a thing of the past. Monarchy will be a thing of the past. Finally, in the future, reason will trump all. Now, he was alive for the French Revolution, um, but he's arrested. Even though he supports the French Revolution, he's too moderate. Radicals who have already moved so far beyond his beliefs have arrested him. And rather than be uh, faced with the guillotine, the national razor, he drinks poison. He kills himself. That shows you how extreme the French Revolution gets, that this man is seen as a moderate by the end of the uh, reign of terror. We'll get there. We will get there. I promise you. Rousseau, Rousseau, finally Rousseau. He was uh, from Switzerland. Uh, he was a Genevan philosopher, writer, and composer. Um, and like Condorcet, he believed in the natural goodness of man. In 1755, he published on the origin of the inequity of man. He breaks down where did humanity go wrong? Where did we go off path? He lays it out. He lays it out. Man was a noble savage who lived in a state of peace and primitive equality for thousands of years. That was until that was until the introduction of private property. This is where everything goes wrong. Private property brought oppression, exploitation and inequality, as well as an end to peace. This is why we have the class divide that we have. This is why we have the societal divide that we have. Private property, private property. Furthermore, furthermore, it isn't just that we have such a class divide uh, in the world with the haves and the have nots. Rousseau argued that civilization as we know it is completely artificial. Nothing is civilized about it and that we have to return away from civilization, which places us all in chains, in bondage, and back towards a more primitive peace. This is what we need to work for. We, in modern times, we would say you have to get out and live off the grid, right? This is still a popular opinion among many. Rousseau believed that societies are formed as a kind of social contract. However, it was the people and not the monarch who should retain the power. Laws should be based on the, quote, general will of the people. What is best for the most is best. If it's best for 51% of the population, that is best. However, what about those people who don't want to go with the general will? What about if 49% of us don't? Well, Rousseau has an answer for you. Whoever refuses to obey the general will shall be compelled to do so by the whole body. This means nothing less than he will be forced to be free. Some people need to be forced to be free. Very modern and quite frankly, very, very dangerous. We will see the French Revolution force people to be free. We will see the Soviet Union in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution force people to be free. Rousseau was very much very much ahead of his time. He wanted no monarchy. Uh, he favored the republicanism, the small city states found in Switzerland. 
Rousseau will die before the French Revolution, but a cult will grow around him and his ideas will live on in the French Revolution, especially with Robespierre, which we'll get to, the extreme faction of the French Revolution. See in Rousseau a man to be emulated, a man to be remembered for all age. Finally, the encyclopedia. The encyclopedia. Published in the 1750s through the 1770s originally, and then spreads out throughout Europe in various forms, this is the first example of linking together the ideals of scientific and technological progress. Another objective of these encyclopedias, to secularize education, to cut away at the remnants of medieval thought. Originally 28 volumes, many authors, it was compiled by Denise Diderot who collected hundreds of authors who were experts on a number of things. Topics included religion, politics, government, philosophy. Now, oftentimes criticisms of government and religion had to be hidden in the guise of humor, um, but they were there. They were there. Also included information on manufacturing, agricultural, uh, agriculture, canal building, etc. By 1789, up to 16,000 copies had been sold. And these ideas will spread to the German states, even Russia. Other nations will copy this. And again, printing is cheap. And so every human, man, woman, can have these encyclopedias and not necessarily even have to attend a university, certainly not a church university. And so this is a continuation of knowledge and seeking truth. Uh, the best example I could use today would be uh, an open and free internet. Could you imagine such a thing? It's a good idea, though. <laughs> now humans can educate themselves away from the constraints of medieval thought, of traditional thought, of institutional thought. This is the objective, at least. Diderot argued this for the need of these encyclopedias, and this is the man who compiled them. Indeed, the purpose of an encyclopedia is to collect knowledge disseminated around the globe, to set forth its general system to the men with whom we live, and transmit it to those who will come after us, so that the work of preceding centuries will not become useless to the centuries to, become, to come. And so that better our offspring, becoming better instructed, will at the same time become more virtuous and happy, and that we should not die without having rendered a service to the human race in the future years to come. How enlightening. We will set forth and give this information for future generations to build upon, much like science. Now, in our next lesson, we will go to France and Germany, where Increasingly, parliaments are ignored and kings believe that they are the representation of God on earth and that they rule solely. This is one of the aspects that all of these philosophers are arguing mostly against absolute monarchy in Europe. Thank you all very, very, very much. I know that was a tough one. I apologize until we meet again.